Himalaya, 1948. With its vast rubber plantations, it was Britain's richest colony. On June the 16th, assassination squads from the Malayan Communist Party were dispatched to rubber estates. At 8.30 a.m., they shot Arthur Walker, an English manager, in the head and chest, killing him instantly. They were the first shots in a 12-year war to end British rule and establish a communist state. For Britain, the battle for hearts and minds and the use of secret intelligence would prove decisive in the empire's war on terror in Malaya. The special branch's job was to produce the information on who was the enemy, where were they, and how were they surviving and lastly, get rid of them. <laughs> In special branch, you have no friends. Yeah? You only know is that you want to get to your objective. And to get to your objective, you have got to be ruthless. The winning of hearts and minds was the key to gaining the best kind of intelligence. And without intelligence, we couldn't win. The Malayan capital, Kuala Lumpur. A parade celebrates victory over the Japanese in 1945. Amongst the troops filing past are the predominantly Chinese soldiers of the Malayan Communist Party. They had fought side by side with British forces during the war. Now, they were secretly planning a revolution. <laughs> Our initial mission was to drive the invaders away and set up the People's Republic of Malaya. Guerrilla warfare was our only choice because the enemy was stronger than us. We had to attack from the jungle. Our spirits were very high. It had only taken us three years and eight months to drive the Japanese away. So we didn't think it would take long to defeat the British. The new day in the East was a day of storm. In India, Burma, Malaya, the conflicts hidden by the war with Japan now came into the open. And in Malaya, the shooting began. Murder, panic, pillage, arson. Malaya was engulfed in a life and death struggle. It was a war. I mean, we can't get away from it. There's no doubt about it. It was a war. But the term emergency was used at the time, I remember. Commonwealth forces in Malaya went into action in 1948, as soon as a state of emergency was declared. The question really depended on the insurance rates which uh, most of the exporters in Malaya would have to pay if uh, the Britain had declared a war. The leader of the communist revolution, seen here being decorated with the OBE, was the 23-year-old Ong Boon Hua. When the emergency was declared, he and his second-in-command, Ah Hai, were hiding in the house of a wealthy Chinese businessman. They both fled. Ong Boon Hua left his passport behind. From that day, he took a new identity, Xin Peng. We were ready to fight against the invasion, but we didn't have any money. So we went to our associate to get funds. But we suspected that we may be betrayed. And so we decided to split and make a run for it. Xin Peng, along with 8,000 fighters, disappeared into the Malayan jungle. The British, many of them inexperienced in jungle warfare, were forced to follow. 
remind me being in a cathedral with the tall trees and the sense of enormity. There's always a smell of decay all the time. It's around you and it's impregnates in your body, your clothes, your hair, everywhere. It's an alien world and it can be very frightening and disturbing. You're always wet. You're wet all the time. The worst thing is in the morning when you get up because your wet uniform hasn't got time to dry. I've got dressed in a river because it's more comfortable than trying to drag on a wet uniform. I thought the jungle was horrible, absolutely horrible. No socks, no underwear, less to carry. Leeches, they're on you all the time, up your legs, under your armpits, around your chest, covered with them, maybe 10, 20, maybe more than 20 of them at one go. If you were operating at night and people were snoring in the jungle, they could be heard some distance away, so all snorers had to be discharged and non-snorers replacing them. I'd stop to have a pedal and uh, next thing was I couldn't pedal because of a, a leech on my penis, down my penis, halfway down my penis. I was uh, passing blood for quite some time until, the, until it healed up inside. You couldn't move um, at any speed at all. If you wanted to fight terrorists, you could only see them for about five seconds at a time and then they would disappear. The contact is so swift, you've got to be quick to get your shot away, and he's got to be quick to get his shot away. It wasn't as if you could, uh, as with conventional war, simply go in, win a battle, annihilate the enemy, go on, win another battle, and then win the war rapidly. And that's what the Americans thought that they could do in Vietnam, but they couldn't. And it was realised that it was going to be a long haul. <laughs> Terror was at the heart of Chin Peng's strategy. I've seen two of my friends being brutalized because he refused to pay protection money. They came three times. Broad daylight, tie up to a rubber tree. Use a knife and then disembowel him. All the intestines fell up. Running dog was what the communists labelled anyone suspected of helping the British. And when we reached there with the police team, you can see a lot of families. This is a running dog. They use a lot of uh, this sort of a killing to instill fear among the people. Support for the communist fighters came from amongst Malaya's large Chinese community. It was organized into a masses movement, or Min Yuen. Whatever they wanted, they would get from the Min Yuen. Food, or medicine, or clothing, or information, and all kinds of things of that sort. So the Min Yuen was absolutely essential for them operating inside. By 1950, with the communists killing 100 civilians a month, a siege mentality prevailed. Yes, they're hand grenades, all right, and the planter's wife knows just how to use them. What you see is almost unbelievably typical, so much so that even the women must go armed. These are the sort of people who keep Malaya going, British and Asian alike, people who are quietly determined that the communist terrorist shall not have his way. Forty-eight to fifty-one, was the tough time when the communists were attacking and attacking and attacking and the police and the military were defending, fending them off almost. For the first three months I was totally convinced I was going to be killed. <laughs> Every time you went out in a car, you felt, you know, prickling on the back of your neck and little green men jumping out into the road in front of you. Saturday nights, the local planters and miners used to come into town to let off steam. And they, it was like the Wild West. Uh, the variety of weapons had to be seen to be believed. 
the, the, the bar used to be covered with Tommy guns and or sawn off shotguns and rifles and grenades that the, they brought with them and just parked there while they had a drink and a dinner. Well laid ambushes struck many a severe blow on our security forces. The problem was that the security forces had virtually no information on an enemy who seemed to be winning the war. Well, it was an awful shambles at the time. and You know, people were getting killed and an enormous British amount of British troops out there. There didn't seem to be any result. The main way of providing an answer to this sort of scene is to have good intelligence. Now, intelligence had been somewhat haphazard in the past, and they wanted to get it on a more ordered basis. Former Commando Evan Davis was Winston Churchill's bodyguard. I've got a message from Scotland Yard one day to say that uh, there's an urgent need for special branch people in Malaya, uh, and we could, if we wanted to, volunteer. I went to Churchill and said, look, I've got this, and he was thrilled. His, he could see in his face it's sinking back to India and beyond, and I, he said, do you want to go? I said, very much. And oh, he was all over me for, wonderful, said, off you go. I was fighting for the Empire. I'm an old Empire man, let's face it. But he arrived to a special branch dogged by bureaucracy and a lack of urgency. I found the registries in the special branch in a terrible state. They weren't proper intelligence registries. After all, we were dealing with people, and you want to get a full file on a person, not on a group or anything like that. And so I remember opening about a thousand blank files and telling the staff, you know, I want to get everything you can about the individual that we know exists in the jungle. And they spent their time finding out what school they went to, who their parents were, whether they were married and so on. Special Branch were now to benefit from a revolutionary piece of social engineering aimed at cutting off Chinese support to the communist fighters. Security forces could pursue the enemy, but they could not cut off terrorist contact with the outside. There was only one answer. Resettle them. Resettle them in areas where they could be defended. We have to take them away so that they are not too near the jungle. The whole place is surrounded by police and the military to prevent any of the villagers from running away, either due to fear or due to duress from the commies. There'd be a lot of crying, you know. Or oh, some of them were cursing me. You say you are a running dog. 650,000 Chinese squatters were forcibly uprooted and relocated into new villages. It was called the Briggs Plan, after the general who implemented it. The Briggs Plan, that was we should get all the Chinese in cages, so to speak. They can work in the field, go out to the rubber estate, go to the tin mines, farm, everything. But they all had, after five o'clock at night, to go inside a wired-in area. We didn't have any food because of these new villages. We were so dispirited and so isolated. They were concentration camps set up by the British. These new villages lying behind barbed wire are guarded by special constables or home guards. Sometimes they gave them some isolated area near tidal swamps and all that. Uh, diseases and lack of good drinking water, the villagers suffered. Within one month, I think over 30 or 40 young children died. But such extreme measures made supplies to the communists easier to intercept. To check the movement of foodstuffs and other prohibited supplies, everyone leaving or entering the camp is searched. They smuggle, this is how they smuggle. Do you observe this lady? Her bra is extra big. <laughs> they smuggle behind a big, big bra. 
Initially, people in the new villages would take spare rice out in boxes and send it into the jungles. Some even used to cover the smuggled food with feces to get it through the British checkpoints. Later, the British got wise to that, so women started to hide rice in their sanitary towels. The Home Guards subjected women to internal examinations in the search for contraband. Chinese ladies, they don't like to be mishandled by, you know, strangers like men. They yell, they cry, and all that. A lot of hardship, I'm afraid, for Chinese, but what a difference it made. The terrorists got hungrier, and they got disillusioned. Evan Davis now placed spies inside the new villages to entrap terrorists looking for supplies. It was quite usual for these people living in squatted huts around the edge to have wireless sets on because there was nothing else to do in that bloody evening. As soon as it got dark, you were in your house and you weren't allowed out. And they used to listen to the wireless a great deal. So they constructed a wireless set that when you turned it off, it automatically sent a signal out, which we had a receiver in our office, which we could pick up, which would tell us that they had arrived in the house. Whenever there was danger or trouble, he only had to switch it off, and he was sending a message to his protectors. And it worked beautifully. In the middle of the night, this carrying party of terrorists came in to the house and the Gurkhas shot 15 of them out of the 20 that were there. That's not bad going. In the middle of the night, and only 20 rounds were fired. Now, that is real soldiering at the highest point. Vehicles, cyclists, pedestrians, all were searched for forbidden articles or contraband which might filter into the hands of the communists. Draconian laws were introduced. Anyone caught with a weapon could be sentenced to death. For the sake of the revolution, we needed to be careful. If we were caught by the British, we would be hung or sent back to China. Often we would be hung. Davis quickly established a reputation amongst the terrorists. He became a target for assassination. They hated us, of course, but I don't think the communists liked me very much. I think I did a rather lot of damage. I preferred having an open car. I somehow felt it was safer, easier to get out in case of an ambush. I used to have my newspapers coming out absolutely regularly from London. Perhaps not quite the reform club, but I always felt I was back in the club at times. I enjoyed it. Life, sitting in the evening, watching the sun go down, smoking a cigar, reading a good newspaper, and having a good drink. It was an easy, pleasant life. And then the telephone would ring and all hell would break loose. <laughs> the communists now struck at the heart of colonial rule. He was going out to play golf and to, to read. I was to uh, be the escort. Blow me down just as we were leaving the radio van that I was in stopped, clunk. The armoured car had stopped behind me, but the Rolls Royce had gone chugging off up the road. So I clambered up on top of the armoured car, hanging on to the turret, and off we went. Suma, Little Horse, and 36 of his platoon had set up a killing box on a winding road. They were after weapons. We roared up the hill, and shots were fired at us.
through my mind flashed, my goodness, we'd been ambushed. We went round a corner and there before my eyes was the scene of the ambush, Rolls Royce. Body of a man in a ditch. And the top of his head was missing and his brains were on the road. Sir Henry Gurney, the British High Commissioner, on his way to play golf, drove straight into Sumar's ambush. Lo and behold, there was Lady Gurney sitting on the side of the road, about 10 yards away from Sir Henry's body. And I said, are you all right? And she said, oh yes, I'm all right. Is Sir Henry dead? And I said, yes, I'm afraid he is. I turned on the wireless set and they said Gurney had been killed. Ambush. Oh my God, I thought, what on earth is happening now? Sir Henry Gurney is murder by communist bandits is a grievous loss to all races in the country, for his administration was justly popular. When I heard he'd been killed, I said, good. He'd come here to invade and rob us. Of course he wasn't welcome. It really shook everybody at the core, especially the government and such. Um, it, it was very difficult indeed. Nobody knew who, what was going to happen next. Um, it was a crisis everywhere, a crisis in government. Winston Spencer Churchill went back to number 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister... He'd just become Prime Minister just before I got back. So I went to Downing Street and there I was upstairs and there he was in bed. Hello, Davis. Hello, sir. Tell me, I'll give you 20 minutes. Tell me, what's wrong in Malaya? To Churchill, the colonial war seemed to be slipping from Britain's grasp. Davis offered the Prime Minister his opinion. I thought the special branch was badly organised. It needed a much more professional intelligence machine than they had. Uh, just one or two individuals were very good. But the general mass of the thing was not proper intelligence gathering. It was got to, you know. General Sir Gerald Templer arrived in Malaya two weeks ago. A guard of honor awaited the new High Commissioner as he stepped off the plane to meet officials to whom he was to be the most powerful head of state modern Malaya has known. With Templer's arrival, the war would enter a new phase. For he is the man on whom so much depends in the war on terrorism. Templer now put special branch in the driving seat. One felt one was somewhat elite, I regret to say. Um, one was very proud of the fact that uh, we were given a lot of responsibility at a comparatively young age. We were given more or less carte blanche to do what we wanted. The army relied completely uh, for operational intelligence on the special branch. Without that intelligence, they might have been groping somewhat in the dark and they wouldn't have had precise targets on which to mount uh, operations. One vital target was the communist secret communication systems. The messages which were carried by the couriers were handwritten, usually very small notes, you know, on a sort of cigarette size uh, paper written in very minute Chinese characters. You'd almost need a magnifying glass to read them. And they could be hidden anywhere. I went by jungle couriers, which would take weeks and weeks and weeks to get through, or they'd send somebody through the buses or the railway, and they'd carry their messages on them. And we would get to know this, and, and we'd um, waylay them halfway and find out what they were carrying. But it was very ingenious because it's almost impossible to be sure 100 percent that you can break it or you can dislocate it. One of the detectives was getting a bit hungry, so he took one of the pineapples and cut it open. And inside, to the amazement of his fellow, inside were rolled slips written in beautifully tiny Chinese plates and rolled up and for delivery. And so we had an idea from, in a flash of the whole extent of Chimpeng's communications and operations. 
A courier message concealed in a tube of toothpaste revealed the location of a notorious communist leader called Yu Kon Kim, known as the Bearded Terror. He was the most unpleasant person by any account, a sort of minor Saddam. Special Branch fed the Bearded Terror's location to the Suffolk Regiment. It was called Operation Churchman and its purpose was to seek and destroy Lu Kong Kim. It was in the early afternoon. We walked into this clearing and there was a sleeping platform from which two people ran. I ran across the clearing, the two people in front of me, visibility, if you remember, being very, very limited, um, firing at noise rather than at sight. The first was a girl, very young, armed with a shotgun, and the second was Lu Kong Kim himself. He was draped over a tree trunk, still alive, uh, as I recall. Uh, he must have had an awful lot of lead in him by then. It was a matter of a, of a coup de grace. He was put on a police Land Rover and toured around the villages. This was obviously uh, to show to as many people as possible that a man who had threatened directly or indirectly their lives and livelihoods uh, was now dead. It was the sort of publicity which needed to be done, however unpleasant you might think it was. News of other unpleasant methods being employed by Britain and Malaya occasionally reached the public at home. On May the 10th, 1952, this photograph of a British Royal Marine holding the severed heads of communist soldiers appeared in the Daily Worker in London. It highlighted the practice of decapitating slain communists for identification purposes. There was an outcry. It's a question of uh, interpretation to me and uh, some of my colleagues. If the man is dead already, and for convenience sake, under the circumstances, you lop his head off, it's no more an at atrocity that you have committed. You already killed him. After one jungle operation, Evan Davis was left with the severed head of a terrorist he needed identifying. The only person to identify it was in the hospital bed. When I went in, I saw him. I said, look, do you mind looking at somebody and telling me who he is? He said, where is he? I said, he's in the sack. He said, no, no, I can't, I can't. Why? If I'm the first person that sees him after his head's cut off, his spirit is going to come into me. And I can't do it. The head looked like a head, but I put it on the sack underneath it, held it up from the end of the bed, and you see his eyes, and uh, he, he recognised it straight away. Quite recognisable people are when their heads are cut off, you know. Easily identified. The reason put forward was, look, we had to do this to bring in, say, a head or hands because we wanted to make sure of the identification of the of the, the, the terrorist who was killed. But of course, there were other ways of doing that. Take a photograph, and also they, they would be able to take fingerprints after, or very easily from using an ink pad, which they, were, which they were issued with. The difficulty of getting a body out of the depth of the jungle was so enormous, and it was far easier to just send a head out to get it identified. But it was frowned upon very, very much indeed. Soldiers were now required to carry the bodies out for identification. Hog tying is like cutting a big length of wood, a pole from a sapling, and slipping it between, after you tie the person's, the dead person's hands together, his ankles together, you slip the pole through wrists and ankles, and, and two people carry him on your shoulder. As communist losses mounted after four years of war, they retreated deeper into the jungle. 
but there were still large parts of Malaya where you entered at your peril. Charles Morgan, a rubber estate manager, and Ian Tedford, a young officer with the Cameronians, were driving back to their base late one night in July 1952. They were traveling through territory controlled by communist leader Go Pen Tuan. He was a terrorist, he was a commissar. He wasn't a freedom fighter or anything like that, he was a straight uh, bad man. We discussed what we would do if in fact we were ambushed. There was only one thing we could do, every man for himself. Everything seemed fine. Coming over a rise, a log straight across the road. I shouted ambush. Shots were coming through the car. Charles jumped out the left-hand door. I jumped out the right. I got shot through the leg. The Luger jam while I was shooting. Uh, I looked around to see where Tedford was and he'd gone. It was a flash, bang, and I was shot. They grabbed me by my hair and held my head upwards to look into my face, shining their torches. And this is when I decided to roll my eyes up, keep my eyes open, roll my eyeballs upwards and to the left, hoping that they would think I was dead. Then I heard the ominous click. I knew then that the time had come. One of the terrorists then took this carbine and he pressed it into my eye. I was sure then that he was going to pull the trigger and that I was going to die. And at that very moment, that is when I, I, I call it a prayer. I didn't pray, I physically pray. I, I saw my, my deceased sister my little sister who died at the age of nine, I suddenly saw her. Whether I just wanted to see something peaceful at that particular time, I don't know. He didn't fire. They dragged me and, and stuffed me underneath the car. And then there was a, a woof and an explosion and the car blew up. Sends me a bit, but in complete panic, I backed off into the, in through the Lalang onto a, onto a small hillock just on the side of the road. I think you smell fear when you're really frightened, when you're terrified. And I was terrified. And I dived up the embankment to get into the jungle. Well, I lay there look, pretending I wasn't there. But I saw this man on the other side of the road, and he then ran across the road uh, and sort of half-straddled me and, and started bayoneting me. I took six bayonet wounds. Finally, the last one went through my back and came out from my left side, piercing my lung, and that hurt. And he took the bayonet off and started to clean it. And it went through my head. The, he was going to shoot me uh, to finish me off. And I, so I got up and I was in my socks because they'd taken my boots. And I ran down the road about 30 yards and dived into some deep grass that was there. I found Charles lying there in a great pool of blood. He had, he had been wearing slacks and a white shirt. And he, he, he had blood coming out of his mouth. And um, he, he, he mentioned the word bayonet. They had to act fairly quickly, and that may well have been one of the reasons why they failed to ensure that they killed both of us. On a ship on the way back to UK, someone came up to me and said, was I J.G. Tedford? I said, yes, and he pointed to this almanac, and it said that uh, I had been killed on the 7th of July, 1952, together with a planter. We had been killed by communist terrorists. I think everything since then has been a bonus. I should have been killed. I'm grateful for every moment I've lived since then.
But by the end of 1952, such incidents were becoming less frequent as the battle for public opinion in Malaya moved center stage. General Templer firmly believed that to win the war, it was necessary to win the hearts and minds of the people. One of those problems which the general will handle is the means of increasing the numbers of Chinese in a hitherto almost exclusively Malay force. It's the Chinese that uh, provides the, uh, most of the intelligence. Without the Chinese, I don't think they, they, they could have won the battle. Yeah? And I believe now it takes a Chinese to fight a Chinese. Robert Chia's role was to run spies within the Chinese community. You are ruthless. And you know very well that if you do something out of it, he might die. Yet you do it. Just because you wanted to have a kill. You can sacrifice one of, the, of your agents just to get three or four of the communists. That's the sacrifice you do. Those caught helping the British paid a high price. They suspected one uh, informant of uh, having assisted the special branch. So one night they came in, they tied him to the lamppost, and they herded the villagers to watch. And they slid him open here at the top of the collar. And one of them put a hand in and took his heart out and started eating it in front of the crowd. This is what is going to happen to all of you if you betray us to the authorities. Uh, if, if that is not brutality, I don't know what is. We were always right to kill the running dogs. Tougher restrictions were now introduced on food supplies. In areas, central cooking was introduced. No amount of food, however small, was to be taken up. Special branch intelligence had by now closed down the remaining food supply routes to the terrorists. They were getting hungry in the jungle in those days. Starved them out. And starved them out mentally, too. Everything was fine when we lived near to the people. But if the enemy attacked us, we'd be forced to flee to isolated areas deep in the jungle, and then we'd be in trouble. We would survive by eating wild vegetables and animals, everything from rats to elephants. Once, when we were on a mission, we were ambushed. We ran into the mountains, and it took 20 days to recontact our army. We had to survive on bamboo shoots. One comrade even shot a monkey, he was that hungry. Chin Peng's men were beginning to turn themselves in. As a further incentive, the government announced tremendous increases in rewards leading to enemy captures or kills. For a kill is so much, for a life capture is so much. And that also goes by ranks. You know, the higher the rank, the higher, the greater the reward. Huge sums if they were big. According to the rank and the number of uh, people, it used to go up in multiples, you know, of a thousand dollars or more. With communist morale plummeting, propaganda leaflets designed to encourage surrenders were dropped on the terrorists. They would drop absolutely millions over the jungle. And the idea was uh, for get them to surrender, and if they came in, they'd have a, a big reward. And some of these communists, I didn't agree with it, picked up big money. When I mean big money, I mean big money. Uh, some of them went even to Manila, had plastic surgery, and then returned to Malaya, nothing but blood money. <laughs> The leaflets were bullshit. They said you have no food, you're lost, give up and you'll get good treatment. But we didn't care. 
They even dropped a leaflet with my family's picture on it. I ripped out my daughter's picture and kept it for a long time until it was destroyed by rain. I finally met my daughter 36 years later. One of these leaflets brought about dramatic results. In April 1953, three communists flagged down a train and demanded to be taken to the nearest police station. One of the young Chinese produced a pack and he put the pack on the table in front of me. I looked at it carefully and I saw strands of black hair coming down the sides. And when I looked more carefully still, I saw congealed blood. And I wondered what on earth could be inside. It could only be a head. They undid the pack. One of the young Chinese lifted the head up by its hair and with a flourish pointed it towards me. And I was absolutely horrified. I'd never seen anything quite like this before. I'd seen plenty of dead bodies, but not a head suddenly pushed within a foot of where I was sitting. Face was as white as white could be. Um, the blood had drained out of the face. It, it looked really ghostly. The eyes were open, not shut. And he was actually looking at me or staring at me. And I thought, oh, I didn't like this at all. I asked whose head it was, and um, they said his name was R. Cook. R. Cook was a name which I knew well because he was one of the five most senior members of the Communist Party in the jungle at the time, a very important man. Uh, two bodyguards saw a pamphlet advertising a vast sum of money for R. Cook, dead or alive, so he decided to cut off his head and bring it in. Next to our cook's severed head lay top-secret communist documents. They revealed that Chin Peng, under constant threat of attack, had left Malaya for southern Thailand and that the Politburo were rethinking their entire war strategy. The importance of the documents was an admission that the, that the military part of the war was not going to produce any short-term results. In fact, it may, might have to go on forever. <laughs> Although heavy losses were being inflicted on the enemy, the communists were by no means a beaten force. Throughout Malaya, captured or surrendering communists were delivered over to special branch interrogators. One of the great myths that the communists put around was that if you get captured by the enemy, and that is the government forces, whatever so they were, you will be tortured terribly. I mean, they're absolutely drilled it into everybody. You will be tortured. You'd say, look, has anybody tortured you? No. You told you were going to be tortured. Yes. You haven't been tortured. So your masters were wrong, weren't they? They have to agree they were so far. <laughs> and you gradually you build this up on somebody and he you establish this relationship in a most curious way. And then you make a judgment. Is he going to work for you or not? And By now, the hard core of militant communism had all but crumbled. Success followed upon success. The rate of terrorists killed or captured went up. High-ranking communists who were captured or surrendered were taken to Special Branch's most secret establishment, the Holding Center a state-of-the-art prison where they could be held without trial indefinitely. I don't think they tortured anybody, <laughs> not that, but I think they had a, a muscly control over, over their minds. I think, you know, brainwashing, I suppose. They had a very hard time in there. The beds weren't quite straight. They had a room built where the walls weren't even and that the ceiling was on a slope and the bed was on a slope. They could disorientate people. The holding centre also housed high-tech backup for secret operations and dirty tricks. I had a special branch gave me some ammunition. He said, what do you think of this, Roy? I said, oh, I said, uh, 303 ammunition. 
What's, like, what's the fuss about it? He said, it isn't normal ammunition. I said, what do you mean? He then explained, he said it was special ammunition, doctored ammunition, that when it's fired, instead of the bullet going, the thing explodes in the breach of the weapon. He says, you've got a free hand, you do what you like. We want you, if possible, see that communists get it into their weapons. So off I went with the ammunition. In fact, within a week, the complete platoon had surrendered. Nine platoon had surrendered. Which was marvellous. They'd surrendered because they, they were afraid to fire the weapons. Uh, I think two or three had been killed when they opened fire because the bridge blown up, blown up in the face. And the others were out afraid to use any ammunition. But not cricket. War isn't cricket, is it? <laughs> After seven years, the war was now going badly for the communists. Chin Peng wanted to negotiate. All necks crane for a glimpse of the number one terrorist. There he is, that's him. Chin Peng, directly responsible for a brutal seven year campaign of murder and terrorism against the ordinary people of Malaya. Peace talks failed. Chin Peng, whose safety had been guaranteed, was led back into the jungle. Even as he departed, the latest operation in a top secret program to eliminate the communist leadership was underway. The special branch's job was to produce the information on who was the enemy, where were they, and how were they surviving. And lastly, get rid of them. <laughs> Top of Davis's hit list was Go Pen Tuan, who had arranged the nighttime ambush of Tedford and Morgan. Summertime. I had a rather pompous little party with the top military and their madams. My boy came in, David, and said the leader of the Minuan gangs, that was the raven. He was upstairs. He wanted to import a, a tremendous piece of message to me of a, a possibility of a very big killing we could make of terrorists in a, a day's time. The Raven was a Chinese spy working for Evan Davis. We had wireless communication and we used to conduct it like a church service. Uh, what hymn will we have this morning, Bishop? And I'd say 704, 703, and it would be a map reference to where they were to go. The Raven had been working pretty well and producing wonderful information for me from inside the jungle. And I said, right, David, I said to my boy, put a white coat on him, trousers, and let him stand in the room. The Raven knew where the notorious Go Peng Tun was hiding. They went in and found out where the camp was. It was the most difficult camp. It was surrounded by swamp and prickles had been placed all the way around it. We got a six-figure map reference. Now, you never had six-figure map references for anything in Malaya before. This was translated, it must be done by bombing. Special Branch fed the location of Go Peng Tun's hideout to the Royal Air Force. I hadn't seen carpet bombing before. I mean, I mean we heard of it in the war, we read about it, but I'd never seen such complete devastation that carefully controlled, what, 20 aeroplanes perhaps? All dropping four bombs, that's 80 bombs being dropped in a neat pattern. And Spot on target. Beautiful. And it was an incredible air raid. A pinpoint accuracy and probably produced the biggest kill in the whole emergency. After the ambush had taken place, I told them, well, you've got to thank the fellow who served you your soup the other night. Not all is with a sense of humour, some of the military. <laughs> ah.
after the big bombing, um, there were tales about refugees staggering away, wounded people, all the rest of it. And I had a complete squad. The Ketchup Brigade was really quite comical in a way. They love play acting, you know, these people. But stagger up to the fence, you know, with blood dripping from a, apparent blood dripping from wounds, and they say, "Oh, you poor fellow, man, you know, we'll look after you," and all the rest of it. And it was very helpful. Again, covering the ground area, so you knew exactly who was moving, who was helping, who was going from A to B. Mm. By 1957, Britain, convinced the war would be won in time, finally gave Malaya its independence but Special Branch continued collecting intelligence. Special Branch evolved into one of the uh, most effective intelligence operations the world had at that time. It was very effective, and it was the uh, ability to, to know what the enemy didn't know before the enemy knew it, and to be able to get the enemy to make mistakes uh, to be able to use the intelligence game from captured enemy personnel, surrendered enemy personnel, and some of them going back into the jungle to bring more people out. I wasn't told his name. Uh, I was told that he was a very senior terrorist who had surrendered. And the group of people with him had been part of his headquarters and his bodyguard, and that we were going with him uh, to try and re-establish contact with his people and that he would try to um, persuade them to surrender. Hall Lung was Chin Peng's second in command and the leading communist inside Malaya. He looked a mild, gentle, very pale chap. He didn't look a, a fierce, warlike sort of fellow at all. Geoffrey Dunn, a member of the Cheshire Regiment, went back into the jungle with Hall Lung. A special branch officer filmed the mission. The idea was that the whole party, the Communist Party and the special branch and ourselves, could get all of our kit into these uh, boats. And we could go down the river far enough to meet people on their old hunting ground without them being aware that we were there. Our job was to be quiet and wait, and hope that he would come back with uh, the people concerned. I think every time he met somebody, he was successful in eventually bringing them back into our camp and um, persuading that they, you know, were going to surrender. And only when he'd talked them round would he admit that he was with a party of um, special branch and military people. Then he'd bring them back to our camp. And then we would sort out how to get them out. And usually that was by helicopter. We got oh, 140 of these people over a, a period. Hall Lung was paid tens of thousands of Malayan dollars for surrendering and more for every communist terrorist he turned. Tunku Abdul Rahman, who was then the Prime Minister of Malaya at the time, uh, t told me later that uh, he'd paid out uh, $495,000 reward money for that uh, group of, uh, of com what were after all communist terrorists. And there was much resentment. Chin Peng remained oblivious to the betrayal for months. It was a mortal blow to his campaign. <laughs> I introduced Ho Lung to join the party. But he betrayed us, and we wanted to kill him because we hated him. He left for the city, but if we ever did catch up with him, we would kill him. It was very significant. The fact was that at the end of this operation, Ho Lung had persuaded the vast majority of the terrorists in South Malaya to surrender, and they'd been taken off the scene, and this led very quickly to the end of the emergency. I think that towards the end of the emergency, there were probably more ex-communists working for us 
then there were communists fighting us. Special Branch had one last leader to capture or kill. Siuma was there commanding the ambush party when Sir Henry Gurney was killed. Siuma was now betrayed by his bodyguards and a trap was set. A special branch officer accompanied one of the bodyguards back to where Siuma was hiding. Two rings on the bicycle would be special branch's signal for the kill. I dressed up like a, a rubber tapper and went on a bicycle together with him. And when we were at the foot of this uh, uh, hill, I rang the bicycle, rang, 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 and soon there was bang, and he was killed. And uh, Siu Ma was such a hefty guy that it would have been impossible to have carried him down. So I decided just to kick him off the cliff. He went pack, 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 against the side of the cliff. And when he came down, you know, he, he, he was like a piece of paper or a piece of rag, you know, you could just shake it like that. All the killings never bothered me. I put it down to that little piece of metal. You never kill him, this little bit of metal killed him. That was my philosophy. I don't have nightmares, nothing whatsoever. Because assisted by Dr. Johnny Walker. Oh yes, it is a real chess game, as you put it rightly. <laughs> you eliminate one by one <laughs> until you are left alone there. After 12 years of fighting, there were barely any communists left in Malaya. Over the border in southern Thailand, Chin Peng survived with only 200 followers. In July 1960, Britain decided that the emergency was over. You have to give your, your enemies a fair bit of credit. And I mean, he only had 8,000 armed men and we had 70,000 policemen, probably 20,000 troops, an air force, a navy intelligence and all the rest of it, and yet they, he managed to hang on to them and hold them together. The guerrillas who remained loyal to Chin Peng followed him here to southern Thailand. Today, three generations on from the emergency, the communists and their families remain in camps like Peace Village 10. Only in 1989 did Chin Peng's communists finally sign a peace treaty. But they remained banned from returning to Malaya because they refused to renounce their political beliefs. In exile, they reflect on how things could have been. The enemy was stronger than us and we made some mistakes. I failed to realize how long the war would last. It only took us three years to defeat the Japanese, so I said at the most it would be twice as long. In fact, it was 40 years. Over six and a half thousand communists were killed during the emergency. Government dead numbered almost 2,000. After a long struggle, Malaya had provided a rare success story against communist expansion. The campaign had a profound influence on future British anti-terrorist operations during the end of empire. Next week in Empire Warriors, British soldiers come face to face with the Mau Mau in Kenya, in one of the bloodiest rebellions in post-war history. It was a war that lasted eight years, cost over 12,000 lives, and changed forever Britain's approach to guerrilla warfare.